Okay, good evening. We've got Richard Honus. And Richard, uh, can you just tell us about who you are, which police force you were with, and, and a bit about what you're doing now, maybe? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, yep, yeah, as you say, my name is Richard Honus. Um, I'm an ex uh, officer from the Met. Uh, I was, I worked for the Metropolitan Police for about 16 and a half years. And of course, the last 14 of those 16 and a half were as, as a frontline police officer. Um, I've worked uh, central London. I've worked in uh, Lambeth Borough, which is a very, very busy area. And I've worked in the, out in the suburbs in Bromley Borough, which, which was um, not quite as busy as Lambeth. Uh, I left in September uh, to become senior lecturer in policing at Christchurch University. All right. Okay, very interesting. No, no doubt we'll hear about the uh, the uh, the Canterbury Christchurch. I, mean, I know I've got a few colleagues who have done an MSc at Canterbury uh, University, so it'll be, it'll be interesting mm. to see uh, what it is that you're doing there. So your experience about leaving the police then, which I mean, obviously you left September last year, so not so long ago, one of mm -hmm. our recent leavers. So are you able to tell about you know, how, how did you plan it? How did it go? What assistance did you get? Yeah, um, I didn't really, it didn't really, I didn't really plan it as such. I, 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 being, I went back to university in 2011 mm -hmm. uh, to do Canterbury's in-service program. Yeah. Um, and I, I graduated from that in um, September 2014. Yeah. Uh, the first. And I applied to uh, get the scholarship for their new Masters by Research program. Mm -hmm. uh, I applied for that, got it. Um, and we were guinea pigs for that program. And so I ended up doing a, a two years master's by research in 14 months, which was uh, very much a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did that on police train. I did that on police training, um, looking at the e-learning system, uh, the NCAO e-learning system yeah. uh, and officers attitudes towards it. Um, I passed that um, with quite a good write up from the examiners. Uh, I applied to do my PhD got onto the PhD program and then the whole um, police education qualifications framework thing started with the uh, graduate entry uh, programs, the pre-joined pre degree, the um, police constable degree apprenticeship proposals and um, a couple of universities, uh, University of West of England in Bristol and Canterbury <laughs> Christchurch University both advertised for a senior lecturer's position. Um, I was already well into the whole academic thing, obviously, because I just started my PhD. Uh, I was about a year into it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I applied, I got interviews with both of them, and Canterbury Christchurch, who happened to be my home institution, uh, offered me the position. Okay. Um, so I, I accepted it. Um, because it was a, it was an incredibly new, uh, incredible challenge. Yeah. Um, something completely different to what I was doing before, and something I think that could actually be quite useful for the future of the organisation. Yeah. Um, and so two days later, I put my resignation in, um, and then and the whole thing just went actually incredibly smoothly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I requested to see my. Um, Borough Commander, yeah, uh, for for a proper leaving leavers in, uh, interview, yeah. And I was invited to go and actually see his deputy, the superintendent, mm -hmm. and I had a very very nice meeting with him. Um, we chatted over a good not a nice cup of tea for an hour. Uh, it turns out he lives fairly local to me as well. Right. Um, didn't uh, didn't try and talk me out of leaving. He saw the I think he saw the opportunity for what it was as well. Uh, and everything went through really, really smoothly. Oh, okay, that's, that's uh, different to one or two we've had. So how, how did you actually feel then, Rich, in terms of like doing that resignation and handing your warrant card in? That's always an interesting feeling when you hand your warrant card over. It was strange. I mean, it was strange. I mean, when I joined, I did. When I, when I when I actually joined up as a police officer, I did do it with the intention of doing the full. Um, 
with pension carryover, it would have been 28 years rather than 30. And then, of course, all the pensions changed. So I would have had to have done uh, 30, 31 years in total. But I, I did join, intending for it to be my career right to the very end. Yeah. Um, but it was a very strange feeling handling in that resignation, knowing that I was going on to something very, very different, although still within the policing field. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so still very much working on police issues, just not as a, not as a warranted officer. Mm. Um, so it was very strange, uh, you know, handing over my warrant card on that last day. Um, and I, I have to admit, I spent a couple of weeks having, you know, those moments when you pat down your pockets, you think there's something missing. Where's my warrant card? And then you realize, oh, no, no I, I don't actually have it anymore. God, yeah. And um, also, yeah, and also having to pay to use public transport again. That's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was quite that was quite a bit of a shock to the system. Yeah, but um, yeah. no, it was it was very strange. But um, I think I did the I think I made the right choice because I think in the role that I'm now in, I can make. Funnily enough, it's that old uh, cliche, isn't it? Making a difference. Yeah, and I think I can make yeah. a difference to the organisation by contributing to um, the way police officers will be educated in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just looking back, there's a bit of us so long ago, it was about four months, four or five months ago. What advice might you give to colleagues in a, in a similar situation? You know, they've got a job to go to and there's always that kind of um, indecision that creeps in every now and then. What advice would you give to colleagues who are maybe about to do what you've done? Hmm. I think... You've got to ask yourself the question before you jump. Make sure that you think it is the right thing to do. I mean, it is a big, big step. Yeah. You know, you've left. You know, you've left um, a very, very secure uh, job. Yeah. Um, however, you know, as it is at the moment, it's a very secure job. It is taking a step into the unknown. I mean, I was lucky in that I knew the people I was going to be working with because yeah. I'd been working with them as, as a student with that student tutor relationship for, for almost six years. Um, so I was lucky in that I had a soft landing in terms of where I was going. Yeah. That was a big help. Um, but I would also say is if you think it's the right thing, don't be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think if, if there, there's opportunities out there and the wonderful thing about the police and in fact one of the one of the great things about the way the police is changing yeah. is going back is can still be an option if you're someone who is in my position that was only halfway through their time yeah yeah, yeah. so you know there is a bit of a there is a bit of a, a, a safety net there I think I mean I don't know what the procedures are for rejoining um but um if you think if you think it's a great opportunity don't don't um don't turn your back on it don't turn your back on it no that's good that's that's, that's good advice and again i know you've, you've moved into the world of academia richard in terms of what you were studying anyway um but um what is it what is it exactly that you do you can kind of give us an idea of what is your what is your day look like what does your week look like what does it actually look like now oh it's very very different right um academia very strange creature um when you've come from a highly disciplined uh, organization i've gone from an organization where you're given a shift rotor mm -hmm. you are told you will turn up on this day at that time yeah you do not go home until that time yeah. and you do your work um, in that time. Yeah. I now only need to physically go into my office two or three times a week. Right. I'm full time. Um, I only have to be there if I'm teaching yeah. or if I've got meetings or appointments with students or colleagues mm -hmm. or I need to access the computer system. Most of the rest of the time, I can work from home. I can keep whatever hours I want. Um, I work off my laptop most of the time. Um, I'm pretty much, I am pretty much my own boss. 
Yeah. My, my own line manager, basically, he says, these are things I want to get done. Um, and he pretty much leaves me to get on with it. Right. Uh, I'm not, I, ha I don't have someone sat on my shoulder watching every move I make. I don't have people sort of, you, you don't have supervisors supervising supervisors who are supervising their team. Yeah. Uh, making sure that the right, pe the, the, you know, the right bit of that tick box is ticked. Yeah. Um, I can read when I want, I can write when I want. Uh, and I say the only thing I'm actually tied to are my appointments okay. and my teaching. Right. It's a really, really laid back, really laid back environment. Okay. Um, I remember my first day I went in, I have to go in early so I can get into the car park because I live 50 miles away from, from the office. So I have to drive in, yeah. which is another, yeah. which is another uh, thing that I've never had to do before. Um, and um, if I finish my day at midday, I can finish my day at midday. If I've done all the work that I've needed to do, yeah. I can finish, I can pretty much finish when I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And and over the last few weeks, I've had lots and lots of marking to do. Yeah. So I I've had a couple of weeks where I've actually done some marking at the weekend by choice, mm -hmm. and then took a day that I would have spent working in the week. And and actually did some did something completely non work related on a weekday, yeah, uh, yeah. choice other than by rotor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I like that. So in terms of um, leaving, then Richard, back. It's only going to say it's only four months. Friends, family impact on friends and family, and uh, you're doing something totally different. You no, I mean not really. I mean, I've, my friend. I mean, I've got I've got a few hobbies where I have friends from outside the job. Mm -hmm. Always made sure I kept my friends from outside the job. Um, I live on my own, so I don't, I don't have any immediate family to worry about. Yeah. But um, what family I have got, my parents live just up the road. I get, I get to see them yeah. um, whenever I need, need to. I've got a new nephew now. Um, about a 20-minute drive down the road, I can go and see him when I want. Yeah. Um, if, anything, if, if anything, I've actually got more time to spend with friends and family. Yeah, yeah. Um, because again, I'm not regimented. Yeah. So I I I, I, I have a lot more freedom um, to do the things that I want to do with friends and family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you actually created more time. Uh, yeah. You got that flexibility. You were saying at the weekends as well. If you want to do some work at the weekends and yeah. during the week, then then that's good. Now it's going to be interesting because I'm I'm quite sure that we're going to have probably not a huge percentage, but certainly a small percentage of of uh, colleagues moving into the world of academia, especially what oh, yeah. you're Richard, about the fact that we're having the, the degrees, the, the degree framework for COPs coming in now. So all that's going to generate some new roles for, for ex-COPs. Yes. Oh, yes. I think I think very much so. I mean, um, given that we're going to have to, I mean, a lot of universities across the country um, are, are, are in the process of gearing up for this expansion in, in the policing world. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we've been very lucky at Canterbury that we, we've been running policing degrees for over 20 years. So we've got lots and lots of experience at it. Yeah. But even we are going to be expecting a fairly big expansion in the work that we're doing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we do already run a pre-service degree um, with the various different pathways. We usually have about um, 70 to 80 students on that every year yeah, um, yeah. imagine when the um pre-join degree uh, as um as uh, outlined by the college of policing comes in yeah i yeah. i would imagine that there'll be possibly even greater uptake if we are running the apprenticeship program for even one or two forces yeah. that's also going to massively increase the number of um, people that we will be teaching and educating yeah. and that's going to require uh, taking staff we're also going to have to look at the current training staff that the police already have mm -hmm. um, they may need to be upskilled and it will probably be down to us as a university to upskill them yeah um, so there's going to be a lot of work coming up and I think a lot of scope for um, ex-police officers who have 
got involved in academia and the numbers who are getting involved now are increasing every year. Um, we're seeing people from all over the country now on, on our programs, yeah. both the uh, bachelor's program and our master's programs. And we've got a couple of PhD students as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I think there's going to be some tremendous opportunities out there for people. Oh, that's good. As an aside, which is not part of my, my interview process, but if you are starting to look for uh, ex-police officers or people from ex-police to go into the training world uh, at your place, please let us know because we will advertise that on, on the Legal Police website. Oh, we will do. Uh, we will do as soon as we start advertising again. And I don't know when we are going to be advertising because at the moment we're still very much in the design phase of, of the programmes, which is what I was, being, I was brought in to do. And I also teach on the on the undergraduate program as well. Um, and I do some lecturing for the, for the, uh, some of the master's students. Um, so as soon as we start advertising for, uh, more people, I will, I'll let you know, I'll drop your line. Excellent. That's so, good. so just go back to your, your own personal development there, Richard. I know you were, you were doing a master's from what you were saying. So, um, you obviously started that before you left. I think you mentioned going back to 2011 to start doing the a, a program of, of learning. So what else have you done? I mean, just talk us through what it is that you had to have in, the, in order to do what you now do. Right, well, ooh, um, yeah, I, well, in 2011, when I um, applied to go on to the uh, uh, Bachelor of Science in Service program, um, what they look for are literally people that want to do it. Mm -hmm. what, what, what we do at Canterbury is um, you don't necessarily have to have any qualifications to start with. Right. One of the things that we do is we recognize um, prior learning and experience right. um, is called RPEL, recognition of prior learning, uh, prior experience and learning, um, to determine whether or not we think that you would be able to complete the program. Uh, and um, so there's an application form which you can fill in. Uh, this, we don't run this program through UCAS. So it's not your standard yeah. uh, undergraduate program. It is designed for serving officers and staff. Mm -hmm. And pretty much if you are a serving officer or member of staff, we even have a couple of uh, special constables as well on our programs. Mm -hmm. If you've been doing that for, well, if you've got out of your probationary period, it means you've undertaken a certain level of learning through your um, your courses, um, you know, the recruit, pro recruit programs, police staff have professional uh, courses that they have to do to enable them to do the jobs that they're doing. Um, and any other previous qualifications we also take into account. I mean, we've, we've had, we've had um, station reception officers, property officers, PCSOs, yeah. police, staff, police officers from pretty much every rank from PC to superintendent on our programs. Mm -hmm. um, and it's their prior knowledge that they bring to the university. And I have to say the staff at the university also learn a lot because not all of them have been police officers themselves. Um, some of them are, have been policing academics for their entire career. Yeah. Um, have not actually served as officers. I know a few people who have ex researchers from the Met, uh, and the Ministry of Justice, um, who have then gone on to work in our department. And they say the great thing that um, our in-service program does is provide the people. Yeah. So um, if, if you have that, then the chances are you will actually get through the program. One of the things that I've always said is, if you're a serving police officer and you've been doing the job for two or three years, you will have the ability to get through the program. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's actually all, all we really look for. Uh, a, willingness, a willingness to do the job and a demonstration that you have undertaken some sort of learning which you've put into practice. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, in terms of uh, social media, Rich, it's interesting you mentioned that you leave the work computer, I think it worked from, from what I heard earlier. But in terms of social media, what, what use have you made of it? Did you have to use it? Uh, I don't have to use it, but I do. Right. Uh, I'm I'm on Twitter quite a lot. Right. Um, I uh, my in fact my um my university uses Twitter quite a lot. Right. 
Right. And uh, the Canterbury Centre for Policing Research, uh, which is the research centre at, at Canterbury, who I'm doing my PhD with, have their own Twitter account. And they're regularly tweeting, as are um, many of my former lecturers, now colleagues. Yeah. Um, they do an awful lot of tweeting. Um, one, of my, one of my colleagues, Emma, I don't think she ever gets off Twitter. Uh, <laughs> um, but I use it quite a lot. Um, I occasionally tweet out things like bits of research that come out that I think might be of use to uh, fellow officers. Right. That's one. That's one of the things I, I have noticed. Even though I've now left the job, I still talk in terms of we do this, we do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, I, you know, even though I'm I've formally left, I still feel part of it. I think once once a cop, always a cop. Yeah, I think. Uh, I, and because I'm. Yeah, that policing family, isn't it? That's that's, that's the phrase that on, the, on our site. We talk about the policing family. And uh, you're right, irrespective of where, where your warrant card is now, it doesn't matter, you're still part of the police department. No. Yes, and, and you know, I still work within, the, as I said before, I still work within the policing sphere. I'm doing this because I want, uh, I want to make policing better than it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that it's, you know, the, the entire sector is going through a really rough time at the moment. Yeah. And if there's anything I can do to help that, um, then that's what I want to do, and that's partly why I'm do why I have actually um, am now doing this job. Yeah. Uh, and one of those things is sharing ideas, sharing research, sharing these um, studies that demonstrate possible tactics that we know work in certain contexts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ways that we can improve the way we do the job. Uh, I actually think I think it's a really positive step. And I think social media is a very, very important part of that. Yeah. Plus, um, yeah. I also use, well, LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn, we, we got in touch um, yeah. through posts on LinkedIn. Um, that's a great way of connecting with colleagues all over the world. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm now yeah. in quite regular contact through LinkedIn, through Twitter, with colleagues in the United States, Canada, um, and Australia, and New Zealand through the network of um, evidence-based policing, uh, sharing information, sharing knowledge, and, and sometimes having a laugh on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah. Important, the important part of the strategy, I think, these days. No, that's good. Thanks, Alex. You know, you're right. In terms of the global side of it as well, it's certainly, it's certainly working for us, because we're, like you, talking to people from Australia, talking to people from Canada, Denmark, of all places, uh, big hit from Denmark. For what? I don't know why, but whether mm. they're leaving in Denmark at the same time, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I love Denmark. I've, I've only ever been there once, and I've always wanted to go back. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it, it's really interesting. I mean, I had um, I had I was messaged by <clears throat> a police officer, I think from Pakistan, um, a few weeks ago, uh, want, wanting wanting my opinion on. Um, his own education levels uh, with a view to maybe doing something uh, with a British university. So um, the international contacts, I think, are fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, and if we can make this world a bit of a better place, then uh, I'm, I'm certainly up for trying to do that. Fantastic, fantastic. In terms of uh, a CV, Richard, did you need to put a CV together to go and apply for the role at Canterbury or not? Uh, if, you apply, if you apply for a role at Canterbury, it's a CV and covering letter. Mm -hmm. um, CV, when I, when I did mine, um, my CV was only two sides. Yeah. Uh, with the basic, you know, it was, a, it was the basic CV, concentrating on the education and professional experience. Um, and then I wrote a covering letter, which I think was about three sides of A4 in the end. Right. Uh, which was basically a covering letter, which included my personal statement. Right. Um, put that in uh, using the, the, the it's an online application system. So you upload that detail, yeah. and I think you had to answer some. Um, you had to answer some the the usual monitoring questions as well. Uh, and yeah, I was I got a phone call. Actually, it was very quick. Actually, uh, I think I, I, I was in college for, for a study weekend. I arrived on the Thursday, walked through the door, got a phone call saying, oh, can you come in for an interview on the Monday? 
Wow, that's quick. That was quick. Um, it took them a couple of weeks to get to that point. Yeah. But, um, yeah, uh, basically they needed someone in post because the, the work the work with the, with the PQF, Police Education Qualifications Framework, was starting to pick up a pace and it was all on one it was all on my line manager's shoulders at the time or my line manager to be shoulders at the time uh so i was you know they got me in because it was it was a post that was really needed they knew it needed to fill yeah just come back to your cv did, did you do it yourself did you research it did somebody do it for you How, what, what hint no I, I i just i just sat down with one of the templates on word Mm -hmm. And I pretty much wrote it from scratch. Um, one thing I one thing I did have when I applied to the job at University of West of England, I actually applied for that one first. Mm -hmm. That one came out first, and that was a totally electronic application form. Yeah, it was literally you logged in, and you filled the boxes in on the electronic screen. But yeah. I was able then to print out a copy of what I'd written. Yeah, and. Off the back of that, I was able to polish it and write my CV using one of the templates, yeah. um, which was really, really handy. I played about with the format a little bit just so that I could fit things on it because yeah. um, I did have a, a fair bit to put on, but always mindful of the fact that a CV should never go beyond two sides. Yeah. Um, but, but I found the template it's a word more than adequate for the job okay. and then when I, wrote, when I wrote the covering letter I used the same style template yeah so you had the style one for CV one for letter yeah uh, and I used the same one yeah and uh, basically tried to keep it all uniform yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, yeah so I, I found that was actually I found that relatively straightforward right uh, because again the template for the most part actually tells you what it is you need to put on Right, that's good. That's useful to know. Uh, we'll have a, we'll have, certainly have a look at that. It's not something we we we're aware of, but um, we're certainly going to have a look at it and spread the word and share the word with people. Yeah, I mean, if I if I can if I, if I can dig it, I should have a copy on my laptop. If you want, I can email you what I actually sent in. Yeah, so yeah. You can have a look if you have to share it, that's always always useful and give it. Uh, I wouldn't ever share it with anybody unless you give your permission, obviously. So, uh, but thanks. That's good. Okay. That's useful. So in terms of Good genetic question we we ask everybody that's left or leaving. What skills and competences do you think are transferable to the outside world? I mean, I know you've gone to academia, but you've been in police in 60 years. So what yeah. would you say are the transferable skills to the outside world? I think there's lots. I think there's, there's lots and lots and lots. And not all of them can be measured in terms of, um, of academic qualifications. Although even that's, I think, now starting to change with things like professional portfolios. Um, you learn very quickly how to talk and not to talk to people. Yeah. I think you learn very quickly that um, if you don't talk to people in the right way, in the right manner, for the right circumstances, um, you can end up having more problems uh, than, uh, than you had before. Uh, and I think that as certainly during my time as a PC before I got promoted, um, I learned that one the hard way several times. Yeah. Um, but you learn. And so your communication skills really, really do improve a great deal. Mm -hmm. And I think that is that comes across really clearly when you talk to ex-police officers who are in other professions now. Yeah, um, I've got a friend who works in um, logistics for a major national um, cross-country coach company. Yeah, and he his ability to talk to people is amazing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is um, you learn to deal with certain stressful situations in a way that when you transfer it into the private sector. Yeah. Um, whereas people who aren't police officers come up with a professional crisis are running around mm -hmm. and you and, and I find a lot of ex-cops who look at these problems they're not running around they're not panicking it's right okay this is important it's urgent it's turned into a bit of a crisis 
Yeah. But hey, let's take a breather. Let's look at it. Let's see what we need to do. And they're able to actually um, deal with those issues in a much, much calmer way. And again, my friend who I just spoke about with the coach company, he now looks at the crisis he now faces and he says, compared to the sort of crisis that I had to face when I was a police officer, no contest. <laughs> yeah. And and every you know, he sees his colleagues running around like a headless chicken, and he is he is the eye of the he is the eye of the storm, and he he's able to to get those sort of things done. Yeah. So, crisis management and problem solving. Yeah. I don't think you the, the whole. I mean, I I worked in I did a lot of community policing roles. Yeah. Um, during my during my time. And problem solving is a really, really good skill yeah. to have, um, which is transferable because the skills that you need to use to do problem solving. So, you know, scanning the problem, looking at what options are, um, trying to fit options to the solutions, then monitoring results, things like that. You do, you do it all the time as a cop. Um, yeah. Certainly if you're a cop working in in community type uh, roles uh, um, and you can take those skills you can take them out of the policing world put them into the corporate world the, the public sector world and you are still able to do that you might not know exactly what all each of your tools are available to you yeah. but again if you don't yeah. know something as a cop uh, one, one of the first things you learn to do is find out yeah um, which is, you know, again, one of those skills that you learn as a cop and not being embarrassed to find out. Yeah. So these are all lots and lots of different skills which you use as a police officer, which you can then into lots of different worlds. And um, I know many, I know many people who have been snapped up because they've actually been able to demonstrate those skills yeah. above and beyond what somebody who may have had. Um, a degree in the particular subject area that that profession works in. Yeah. So I, I've known people. I've known people in the corporate world who've taken ex cops on rather than fresh faced business graduates. Yeah. Yeah. Because the police officers have actually been out there in the in the real world and um, have learnt from the school of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and have those skills. And in fact, I think one of the one of the great things that this new um, education framework um, is going to do is it's actually going to formalize um, those experiences and give serving officers the option to take out those qualifications based on their previous service so they can actually then sort of solidify and have that have that certificate which actually which actually will mean something when 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 they leave if they wish to take it up yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Re some really good stuff there, uh, Richard. I, I picked out there with the crisis management bit, the communication skills bit, and the uh, problem solving. A mm. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, couldn't, couldn't disagree with any of that. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, that that ability to kind of weigh things up and uh, what do you call it? The school of life. That's a really good phrase. Yeah. And I think I think I think the I think the last other the other thing is, police officers all the time have to actually make concrete decisions. Um, so if you want, if you want to employ somebody to actually take decisions, um, then you do a lot worse than actually hiring a cop because a cop will make decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to, as opposed to one of my colleagues who, who says, you know, I'm a philosopher for a living. I, I don't like answering. I don't like making decisions. I like exploring the questions, but I don't like actually actually having to make the decision at the end of it. Um, yeah. uh, but that is something, again, that a police officer has to do. They actually have to, at the end of the day, they have to do something. Yeah. Um, and so I think, again, that coming from, coming from a, a, an action-orientated background, uh, I think he's also a big help uh, in today's world of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks for that. Thanks for that. I mean, I'm not sure how, how much notice you gave uh, Metropolitan Police. It didn't sound like the, or, or any more than the usual that you have to give. But in terms of finance, I mean, mm -hmm. what advice did you seek? Did you seek any financial advice? Did you just work it out yourself? Any hints and tips? Not really. I'm, I, I didn't seek any out because, I mean, I still sort of 
I'm still a long way off from retirement. Yeah. Um, I the, all, all I had was the um, pensions form uh, to transfer my pension into the new pen, into my new pension scheme. Yeah, with the university and um, the form that I got explained my options of you know taking it all out now, leaving it there until it comes back or rolling it over into the new pension scheme. Yeah. And given the length of service that I had, um, what the length of service I would have have to have and where I now am with regards to my current employment, it just makes sense to roll it over. So into, into the new pension scheme, right. I didn't seek any formal advice around it. I did ask a couple of my colleagues who are actually close to closer to retirement. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, discuss with, them because they knew a little bit more about the pension system than I do. Um, I have to admit I was one of those that never really planned that far ahead. Uh, maybe it's time we actually started, but um, yeah, I, I didn't seek out any particular formal advice. Um, and all I got was the standard um, job forms. Okay. Okay. Again, and, and it's, and it's each, each to their own. Some people do plan it well ahead. Some people don't. It's not, not everybody's priority. So, no, I, and, I, and I get that. Just, just winding back a little bit, Richard, you mentioned you had a very quick turnaround from a job application. Yeah. To an interview. So in terms of interview preparation, mm -hmm. uh, what, what did you do? How did you do it? And then again, what advice would you give to others? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is don't panic. Um, <laughs> uh, the application form went in and I got the phone call about a month later to say, can you come in for the interview? Three days. <laughs> Fortunately, I, I was at college. I was going to sit down and do some PhD work, but my plans changed that weekend. Um, I had to do uh, a 10 minute presentation on um, delivering uh, an apprenticeship scheme in partnership with the police force. It was a verbal only presentation, so there was no PowerPoint, yeah, yeah. no audio, visual, no flip charts. It was just te a 10 minute, effectively a 10 minute talk uh, on it. Um, fortunately I was studying as part of my PhD, I'm studying the, uh, education qualifications framework. So that helped. Uh, so I had all the documentation that I needed. Uh, yeah, so pro proper planning and preparation that helps. Um, and so I actually spent most of that weekend, uh, writing my presentation and reading up on curriculum and the guidance on uh on on how to uh, run the scheme so um i i came so i was there on the thursday on the friday saturday morning came home up on the sunday and um, monday afternoon i had the interview okay so you had i, I think you I think you were probably lucky in some respects, but like you say, it just so happens that it's a bit of a niche thing, what you're doing, you did have, you know, what you yeah. were doing at the time was kind of fortuitous, and that you kind of, kind of probably didn't need to prepare in, in the way that maybe some others might have to. Would that be fair to say that? that that's fair, yeah. And, um, I, spoke to, I spoke to some of my colleagues who, who were not going to be in um, assessing me uh, at the interview, um, just asking for their opinion, and um, they 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 they, you know, they gave me a little bit of advice on things to look at, um, certain things to talk about, yeah, um, such as things like organisational reputation, institutional um, reputation is always a good thing to throw in, um, you know, getting a little lie of the land with regards to some of the interviewers. Yeah. Um, I knew one of the inter I did know one of the interviewers, but he did sort of declare that um, yeah. at the interview stage. Yeah. Um, so that was, and, and I didn't have much time really to consult with my uh, police colleagues because I, I was actually off work from the time I found out yeah. I had the interview till the interview. So, um, so apart from the a couple of. Uh, wishes of good luck from them. I didn't have much contact with colleagues before I actually sat down and did the interview. Yeah. Um, yeah. But hey, um, 
turns out I didn't actually need it. So, <laughs> no, that's good. So, and the rest, is like, the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, just slight change in topic here. So leaving the police, which is what we're all about, it is a daunting prospect no matter when you leave it, whether that's at two years or you know, 32 years, it's still daunting, whether it's a natural yeah. climate or an enforced climate. But what did you find the most daunting aspect of it in the whole process of, of doing it? The most daunting part of it was literally that very last day. Um, every all of my kits bagged up, and I drop it off into the admin office, and I handed my inspector my warrant card, and I knew that that was the, the going to be the last time I was going to be leaving the building. Yeah. Uh, without an escort. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And walking out of the police station that very last time as a, as a police officer. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure I will be popping back at some point um, for various things. I've got a friend whose retirement's coming up. Yeah. But, um, yeah, literally that last day was, was da it, yeah, daunting is a good word. Yeah. Um, because you are stepping out. Yeah completely different yeah I consider myself lucky that it wasn't a complete jump into the dark yeah yeah you knew you, were, you knew. I knew where I was yeah. yeah I knew where I was going I knew who I was going to be working with yeah in fact it was less daunting than some of my uh, transfers that I've had over the years <laughs> um, the only th the, the most daunting the most daunting time I've ever had be before that was literally my first day as a sergeant in my new nick on promotion yeah um going from um charing cross to kennington which in terms of the style of policing and the type of work that was done at those two stations were very very different yeah and i'm there i am the sergeant now and it was oh my god what am i letting myself in for yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was even more daunting than my first day as a PC, actually. Wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my first day, my first day as a supervisor was actually more daunting than my first day as a PC, because on my first day as a PC, there were eight of us, all starting on the same day, all working together. Yeah. Um, so that was a, that was a little bit less of a of a jump in the dark, uh, at least not jump in the dark on your own. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that was how I would sum that up. But, but yeah, leaving the nick for the last time. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've heard phrases like some people even have used the word naked. They feel naked when they walk out the building. Because yeah. You don't have that uniform anymore because you haven't got that warrant card anymore. You've handed everything in. And yeah. It's a civilian about on, on, on City Street again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I can totally understand it. Yeah. In terms of engagement with former colleagues, then. Uh, yeah. What, what, what engagement do you have? I suspect you still got some because of what you do, what you now do. Oh, I, I still bump up. I mean, I, I still work in the borough where I was last posted, so I do bump into them from time to time. Yeah. So it's always, it's always good to see them and see how they're doing. Yeah. Um, and again, social media is great because um, I'm on Facebook with uh, a large number of my team. Oh, and in fact, I'm, st I'm still in touch with colleagues that I went to Hendon with. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of them is now one of my students uh, <laughs> um <laughs> wow. uh, he's, he's, uh, so i am still in touch with 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 some of them in fact funnily enough two days ago i got invited to one of my uh, former colleagues 40th birthday party uh, oh, yeah. in a couple of months so i'm i'm going to be going to that hopefully catch up with the gang see yeah, how they're yeah. doing have a couple of drinks um so i'm st still in contact with them um and as i say because again one of the things about what I'm doing now is because so many cops are are doing these courses now. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of them are people that I know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I yeah. know a great number that are on the um, the bachelor's in service program. Um, my classmate from Hendon that I just mentioned, he's one of he's one of our master students. Uh, I'm hoping he's yeah. going to be finishing his his MSc very soon. Mm -hmm. and uh, I can very much see him staying on to do his PhD as well. 
Um, so I am still in contact. Uh, and I do see them flag up on Facebook from time to time, always uh, there to share a, a joke and a sarcastic comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, As police officers are wont to do with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, coming to the end of the interview now, Richard, in terms of, uh, you, you left, what, four, five months ago, as we were saying here, um, we didn't obviously have a Leaving the Police website then, but had we had a Leaving the Police website, what kind of things yeah. have you been looking for to support you in, in your, your, your new, new role outside of I probably would have asked the question about what should I do with my pension. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not something that was a major issue for me, but it would, you know, it would have been nice just to have that extra um, opinion about which of the three options I could or should have taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, plus the fact, um, I, th I think um, just, you know, Tips on, tips on, um, on things like transport. Um, tips on 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 getting around because I, I used to, although I had had my car because of the because of the ATOC scheme and the and the yeah. and the and the free travel that we had. Um, I I tended to use public transport more than I ever used my car. Yeah. So. Uh, Little, little, little bits of advice on that, and how to save money here, there. Yeah. The things I found with my current salary, even though the the gross is um, a little bit less than what I was earning. Yeah. Because I have a lot, f a, a fewer uh, deductions. Um, my take home is actually about the same. Yeah. Um, but anything yeah. on things like saving money, although I know as a PhD student, I have my student card as well. Yeah, yeah, make lots of use of that, and um, and just to uh, just to keep in touch with people, stay in the loop. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, keep up with what ideas are out there because, again, with my in my current job, keeping an eye on what is going on in the policing world, yeah. uh, is part of what I I, I do. Um, I look at it as as a bit of a, a more of a, from a, as a bit more of an outsider, but I'm an outsider that's had some inside. Um, experience and knowledge, and I think I think that does help. Yeah, that's some really good stuff. There. That, 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 some really interesting ones there, which we, we've not had before. The, the saving money thing is an interesting one. We haven't actually kind of partnered with a particular organisation yet deliberately. Um, mm -hmm. Let's wait and see how that pans out. But certainly, that's something we would we would give it. The tips and the transport one is an interesting one. Because yeah, we're going to get probably quite a quite a nucleus of, of ex mets. I'm sure within. The Facebook group, it's going to be a closed Facebook group. Pretty yeah. confident you can give you the answers to those questions fairly early. Well, I, pretty, I pretty much now have found the answers to most of those. I mean, I, I went and got my own Oyster card, yeah. and, I, and I now know, actually, don't bother with an Oyster card, just use your bank card, pay yeah. as you go. It actually works out cheaper, yeah. just to use your bank card. Yeah, yeah. You, so, um, so rather than waste money on the extra that I have to put on, um, and when you do round trips up to, up into central London, which I have to do from time to time, yeah. sometimes I teach up there, sometimes have meetings up, up in London, yeah. rather than getting a travel card, it's actually cheaper just to use your, your pay as you go card because it's all capped. Yeah. And yeah, the capping actually works out cheaper. So things like that, they're just li little, little pieces of advice, you know, yeah, but and I think that that will, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, say, every little does indeed help. I think it's as that say that. <laughs> yep, I shop there from time to time. <laughs> uh, just uh, for an ultimate question then, Richard, in terms of uh, if you could visualise the future, what, what, what does success look like for you then, now that you've left policing? Now that I've left, success for me would be, I'd say five years' time, um, I've completed my PhD, mm -hmm. Um, the degree apprenticeship and the pre-joined degree programs are up and running. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully I'll be program director of one of those. Mm -hmm. um, that's a technical term uh, from the university's point of view. It's the program director is the person literally that heads up the, 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 the actual overall course. Um, and so manages the course. Yeah, uh, and that we get some really good quality people through, and hopefully in five years' time, 
we'll be having our first graduates from those programs actually coming through and qualifying as uh, fully qualified police officers. Oh, brilliant. That sounds really good. So, um, well, certainly and, and, and I'm hoping, and I'm hoping that they will be the quality that we are hoping for. I'm sure they will. Uh, lots of hopes there. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, is if, if it doesn't quite work out, one of the things that I've also learned is you need to learn from when things don't go as well as they actually happen to go. Yeah. Um, this is a program that's being, you know, pushed forward by the College of Policing. Yeah. Um, the forces themselves are on board. Um, it's just um, how the other officers will see these new folks as they come through. Hopefully they'll yeah. see them as valued colleagues and good officers. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Okay, then. my last one really is more, and it probably probably you can easily follow on here. Is but it's, you can give a business, an organisation, a charity, whatever you want. Uh, yeah, a couple of minutes of, of whatever you want to say. So you want to promote Canterbury University, then that is absolutely fine. But just well, a couple of minutes, saying what do you want to say? Well, okay, fine. Um, two things. Then I, I really want to promote. First one is yes, Canterbury Christchurch University. Um, the policing team there are absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. If there's Anybody out there who is a serving officer at the moment uh, um, think, and is thinking of doing uh, a university qualification prior to leaving so they actually have a formal qualification to fall back on. Yeah. Uh, In-service program is there. It's um, uh, www.canterbury.ac.uk. If, um, if you follow the tab for schools, we are part of the School of Law, Criminal Justice and Computing. Interesting selection of courses, but our computing department does a lot of forensics and cybercrime. Yeah. Um, so if anybody's interested in doing that, we also have master's programs running. So um, if you already have a degree or you have considerable experience in an area and you want to pursue something like a master by research yeah. um, or our talk masters in professional practice, all the details are on our website. They are fantastic courses. We're a good bunch. Um, you know, come down to come down to our study weekends. Uh, we'll introduce the student union and student life as well. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a way of saving money. Uh, the student union, um, and that uh, and it's a fantastic opportunity. I, many of our colleagues are taking it up, um, and if you've got to this point in your career, you are more than capable of doing the program. I am absolutely sure of that. Really? The last thing I want to promote. Uh, is the Society for Evidence-Based Policing, mm -hmm. which is um, a free-to-join membership organisation uh, dedicated to uh, promoting the use of um, research in policing to try and improve the way that policing works. In fact, you don't even have to be a police officer or an academic. Anyone can join it if you're an interested person. Yeah, It is free. Um, and uh, I can't remember the website offhand, but if you type in Society for Evidence-Based Policing, uh, it'll come up top of any Google search that you do. Uh, I'm currently the Learning and Development Coordinator for that, so I do have a, I, I will express my interest. Um, our March conference, sadly, is sold out, um, but we do run yearly conferences, which are fantastic uh, to attend. We have some really, really great speakers from all over the world coming. Uh, and in fact, we have attendees coming from all over the world. Um, it's a great place to network. It's a great place to share ideas. And it's a great place to get some uh, ideas about tactics. And that is that old thing about problem solving again. Um, those ideas that can help you solve your problems. Brilliant. So, yeah, besides the evidence, I face believes in. What we'll do, Richard, off that, thank you very much for that. Two, two really good, uh, good, good last mentions there. I'll get some detail with you offline. Uh, yep. What my, what's going through my head at the moment is we, we will have that on our website. We've got a, um, a free services page, and we'll, have, we'll maybe have an academia sub page to go with that. It's not yeah, that'd be great. Well, um, I'll talk to you offline, but listen, online, thanks very much for this evening. It's been a, a, a fantastic and quite unique talk for somebody who's gone to academia. Uh, yes. And I'm sure we're going to have other colleagues that are going to go very similar routes as you. So thanks very much for this evening, right. and uh, good luck at uh, Canterbury Press as well. Thanks very much. Take care. Okay.